Hello and welcome. My name is Tino Corsetti. I'm Associate Director of Learning Innovation at the School of Continuing Studies here at the University of Toronto. We're very happy you could join us today. We have brought together four of our instructors to speak about four different areas, uh, project management, risk management, data science, and digital and multimedia storytelling. This presentation is about uh, part of a new series called Realize Your Dreams. It gives us a great opportunity to introduce you to our instructors so that they can share not only the depth and breadth of expertise that they bring to our learners in our courses and programs, but also you can see their passion for lifelong learning and continuing education, which is such a key part of a career today. Our guests have been asked to speak about these several questions. What are the hot jobs in your field in the next five years? What are typical job titles in this area? What skills, experience, education, or training are required? What types of organizations or departments will be hiring? And is there a trend in entrepreneurial or independent consulting in this field? So we're gonna start with project management and we're gonna put Peter Monkhouse on the hot seat. Let me introduce you to Peter. Um, Peter has over 30 years of experience directing and managing projects in Canada and around the world. He has worked in a wide range of sectors, including telecommunications, software, and education. Peter was the president of the Southern Ontario chapter of the PMI, the Project Management Institute, and served six years as a director on the PMI Global Board of Directors, including being chair of the board in 2012. Peter is currently a director on the board of the PMI Education Foundation and was elected secretary for 2016. Additionally, Peter teaches in the project management program here at the School of Continuing Studies. So let me turn the podium over to Peter. Thank you, Tino, and good day to everyone. I'm pleased to be here to talk to you about project management. In fact, today is a special day as today we're celebrating the 40th anniversary of the PMI Southern Ontario chapter with a gala this evening. The Southern Ontario chapter was the first PMI chapter to be formed outside the United States. But let's talk more broadly about jobs in the project management field. So at PMI, we've done a number of research into how project management can help organizations and what the demand is for project managers. In fact, the studies we have shown is that globally, there's a demand for 1.57 million jobs a year for new project managers. Now, this is a huge number of new jobs for people to take on in the project management field, but it's only a part of the story. What we're also seeing is that the baby boomers are starting to leave the workforce and leaving the workforce with their talent and managing large and complex projects. So in addition to these new jobs, there has to be people come in to backfill and fill in for the people, baby boomers who are retiring onto um, their next career or the next part of their life journey. But it gets even more interesting than that. The studies that we've done at PMI shows that organizations that utilize project management and have a mature project management practice can be much more successful, in fact, twice as successful in completing projects that meet the objectives. So that this means that organizations are now starting to understand that they need to improve their project management maturity and their project management practice. In fact, as you can see from one of the stats that I have that 95% of the CEOs are saying that project management is one of the most, if not the most important job that their organization can have. So we are now seeing that organizations and senior executives are valuing project management and looking to hire project managers to actually run their projects. They're looking to have more project managers and they're looking to help develop those project managers. But the story is, doesn't end there. They're looking not just for anyone as to be a project manager. They want people with the skills and the capabilities that will allow them to manage the projects the organizations have, the organizations that have today. They're looking for people with talent. And this is where we're seeing, in fact, there's a war for talent. Because although there's many people who don't are looking for jobs, the people who have the skills and capabilities in particular for project management are in high demand. 
and that organizations are looking for them. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is that organizations are no longer investing in their own staff. They're not helping them acquire the skills and knowledge that may be lacking, but they're looking for you as individuals to do that. And that's where here at the School's Continuing Studies at U of T, we can help out with having project management courses to help you acquire those skills and knowledge. But what are the skills and knowledge that employers are looking for? As I said, they know they have to, to manage projects, they have to have um, a project methodology and process in place. They know that projects are gonna help them achieve their business objectives. So what are those skills and knowledge? Well, PMI has recently uh, introduced what we call the new talent triangle, which talks about three broad sectors of skills and capabilities that as project managers you need to have. The first is very straightforward. It is project management technical skills. And in fact, this is where the industry started in looking at is around having us to be good technical project managers. How to develop good schedules, good budgets, how to do good risk analysis, very technical parts of the managing a project. Yet as we saw that project managers acquired those skills and became better at building budgets and schedules, projects were still failing. They were still having trouble. So about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we started thinking about what else is there? And this is where we started talking about leadership skills. That project managers are leaders in their organizations. They're not only are they leading the project team, helping that project team come together to work to achieve the objectives of the project, but they're helping the organization in leading the organization through change, which inevitably projects are doing in the organization whether it's introducing a new product or service or changing the way the organization works in order to be more productive, which has to be done in this highly competitive environment. So project managers needed to have what we call soft skills, ability to negotiate, ability to communicate effectively, ability to motivate people. In fact, recent studies that PMI has done shows the number one reasons why project fails are because of poor communication. So this was a third dimension, the second dimension that project managers need to have. And the third dimension, which is the one that's sort of the more recent thinking is around as project managers, we need to have business and strategic management knowledge. It's all very well to say we can communicate and know how to communicate, but we need to be able to communicate in the language of our stakeholders, the language of the people who are impacted by the project or impact the project. We have to know their language. We have to be able to speak in the language of the business. We have to know what value our pro the product or service of our project is delivering to the organization. And we have to be able to know how our project links to the strategy of the organization. So here at U of T in our School of Continuing Studies, we are focusing on making sure that in our program project management courses, that we address all three of these areas to help you as potential project managers acquire the skills and capabilities to be excellent project managers. In addition, at the school, we have uh, courses that are designed to help you with the certifications that PMI has, in particular, the Project Management Professional or PMP, to help you signal to the marketplace, to those employers who are looking for project managers that you have the skills and capabilities to, to be a great project manager. So I hope that I will see you in one of my classes in the next term and um, hope you have a great day. And now I'll turn it back to Tino to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. That was really interesting. Um, I can't think of too many areas of business that aren't run as projects nowadays. And so uh, a program like project management is interesting, not only for people who want to become project managers, but people who are part of projects or are project team members to understand how they work and best practices. We're gonna move on to risk management. I wanna introduce Deb Traconia. In addition to being an instructor here at the school, Deborah is risk and insurance manager for the corporation of the city of Brampton, which happens to be the fastest growing municipality in Canada. Deborah created and is now responsible for the effectiveness and administration of the city's insurance and risk management programs. She is past president of the Society of Public Insurance Administrators of Ontario. 
She's a member of the Ontario Municipal Insurance Exchange Nominating Committee and past board member of the Ontario Risk Management Society. I think you'll agree that Deborah's in a great position to share her thoughts on the future of careers in risk management. I will turn the podium over to her now. So good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. I'm here to talk to you this afternoon about risk management and specifically enterprise risk management. So I want to start off with giving you a little bit of background because risk management has significantly involved, evolved over the last few years. So a few years ago, when you heard people talking about risk management, you automatically associated it with insurance, right? Fires, floods, accidental losses, and those were the, the key risks that were being managed through insurance. There was a survey done about four years ago, which opened up a lot of people's eyes, and that said that only 30, 25 to 30 percent of a corporation's risks were actually insurable, right? So that's a pretty scary statistic when you flip it to the other side. When you flip it, what that means is that 70 to 75 percent of an organization's risks were not being managed at all, right? So that's when people started embracing the concept of enterprise risk management. And that's where we've evolved to today's uh, environment. What that means is it's a very holistic approach that covers an entire corporation's risk. So you've still got the little piece of insurance in there, there's no question, but it covers everything else. So operational <coughs> risk, strategic risk, reputation risk, finance risk, all of those elements are very much at play. And that's where the corporations are moving to embrace these days. Um, I'm gonna take you back to 2008 when we had the financial crisis. And what that did was it sent shockwaves throughout the financial industry. The reason I'm sharing that with you, immediately following the financial crisis, uh, the government stepped in with very significant changes to their regulations. A lot of those regulations included elements of risk management. And the reason that's important is that when you start Googling risk management jobs, you're going to recognize that right now, the vast majority of those jobs fall somewhere within the financial sector. Um, that is strictly because of how it was forced to evolve with the, with the regulations that were opposed. Um, don't be discouraged by that by any means. There are a huge number of corporations and industries specific that are now moving into the risk management field at a very rapid rate. So areas like transportation, um, government, education, healthcare, all of those areas are embracing the concept of risk management. Government has taken a whole different element. Federal, provincial, and municipal are all embracing and enterprise risk management right now. Um, we see the results of risk impacts every day. You open up the newspaper and you see risks that are, you know, maybe there was, um, you know, a train derailment or we're dealing with severe weather conditions these days because of climate change. Um, you know, it wasn't that long ago that we had the Calgary floods, the Toronto floods, the ice storm from, from Toronto, and we're told that those severe weather events are here to stay. They're becoming the norm. That causes a significant amount of business disruption for organizations that need to be managed. Um, you, you hear them talk about business continuity planning, disaster recovery. All of those elements are ingrained within the risk management profile as well. And what you'll find is that we actually use business continuity planning, for example, as a risk mitigation tool. So I want to take a minute to tell you exactly what risk management is all about. It's a definite process. It involves risk identification, uh, analysis, uh, monitoring, control, risk mitigation. It's very much an ingrained process. It, um, there's lots of theories and concepts behind it. There's lots of tools and techniques that are applicable. But what I find really cool is that risk management, enterprise risk management specifically, can be ingrained into any organization these days, big, small, private, public, it doesn't matter. Um, and we're seeing very much one of the biggest benefits of enterprise risk management is better decision making. So with the corporations that have truly embraced it, their executives and people that are in a decision making mode are absolutely seeing better decision making. They're moving their businesses forward with their eyes wide open. 
they've recognized the risk, they've analyzed the risk, they know the impacts, whether it's um, positive or negative, and they're moving forward with those, uh, with those decisions. Um, I want to talk very briefly about job descriptions. So when you get into the, draw, the, the job description search, you're going to find elements like uh, risk analyst, risk coordinator, um, risk associate. Those are typical your entry level positions into the risk management field. You'll see positions becoming increasingly more responsible until you reach the top, which is typically a chief risk officer. A chief risk officer typically will report directly to a board of directors or a CEO, and he or she will have responsibility for a corporation's entire risk management portfolio. What is unique with those areas is that communications is a huge element of risk management. Interpersonal <coughs> skills, team building. You can't do risk management alone. All, all areas of the corporations are engaged. And there is a designation that the University of Continuing Studies um, offers, and it's a CRM designation. That is very highly respected and required throughout Canada now for uh, any kind of position that is looking at enterprise risk management. So I understand my time is quickly running out. I wanted to leave you with some uh, final thoughts specifically related to emerging risks. That will help you hopefully understand the push for where risk management is evolving. So it was only a few years ago that cyber risk, for example, wasn't on anyone's radar. Cyber risk today, in, a, in, a, in association with reputation risk because of our social media impact, is now a couple of the top risks that our C-suite executives are losing the most sleep over, okay? Um, the other element is drones. We never had drones before. And quite frankly, the transportation sector isn't quite sure what to do with them because they've shut down airports, they've landed on the White House lawn, and they're collecting data as they fly. So drones are another emerging risk that we're looking at. And the last one, uh, you know, is really the driverless cars. Think about where we're going with driverless cars. They're being uh, tested throughout the world right now, and everybody seems to think that uh, they're here to stay. So our, um, our world is really an ever-changing landscape these days with risks everywhere, and I'm very much convinced that um, enterprise risk management is here to stay. So thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity of talking to you today. Thank you so much, Deb. That was such an interesting and comprehensive overview of the field of risk and also uh, career opportunities in, the, in that field. So we're going from project management to risk management to data management and data science. I'm going to introduce Larry Simon, our next speaker. Larry is an entrepreneur, management consultant, an angel investor specializing in business-oriented IT strategy, governance, and analytics. He has over 30 years of experience advising global corporations government institutions, and early stage enterprises. He's currently managing director of Inflection Group and Graph Intelligence. <coughs> Prior to this, he was a partner with Ernst & Young Consulting and national director of their strategy and delivery centers. He has previously served on the faculty of the Rotman School of Management and on the boards of the Canadian Information Processing Society, Canadian Information Productivity Awards, Community Eye Performance Awards, the Institute of Certified Management Consultants of Ontario, and IASA. Larry holds an MBA from the University of Toronto, a BMath from the University of Waterloo, and is a certified management consultant. Additionally, Larry is also an instructor here at the school. Happy to have you, Larry. I'll turn the podium over to you. <clears throat> Thanks, Tino. What I'd like to talk about is the, the huge opportunity that uh, is in front of us right now. It's a, a really exciting time, the most exciting time in at least a decade. <clears throat> so if we, uh, if we go back uh, to uh, the turn of the century, um, the, so, so if you think about how technology evolves over time, it consists of a, a series of of changeovers of technology as technology itself improves, it allows us to create new platforms and those platforms then allow us to create new applications. So for example, um, breakthroughs in data communications in uh, the 1990s allowed us to create the internet. 
created uh, web, created uh, YouTube, the ability to do kinds of things that we're, we're doing here today. Um, and then we had the uh, mobile revolution. There's another revolution that's going on that's, that's a little bit quieter, uh, but has to do with the fact that uh, th there's been increases in the capabilities of creating systems of, uh, of individual computers that can work together as distributed clusters. And what this has done is, is enabled a, a revolution in, uh, in data. So what, so, uh, what this has done is it's created a huge interest in mining the vast <coughs> amounts of data that are out there that are created every day. We have data that's streaming from our, our mobile telephones. We have information that's being uh, produced by financial systems. We have information that uh, is being gathered by, by drones, by uh, television cameras, all of it in um, you know, large quantities in a very raw form. Uh, but what it's done is it's raised the question of what can we do to take that data, capture it in its raw form, and do novel kinds of analysis on it. So uh, people are asking questions like, how can we use this information to improve crop yields? What can we do to, uh, for example, understand uh, consumers' uh, behavior better and perhaps uh, offer products to them that are better suited to their uh, individual needs? Uh, how, how do we make uh, cities more effective, safer for their people? How do we improve traffic flow? Um, you know, all, all kinds of possibilities of things that we can do uh, if we gather that information and we analyze it in, in the right way. Um, so as a result of this, there, there have been a number of new roles that have appeared. Uh, one of them is uh, the, the role of the data scientist. Um, and related to that, roles like uh, you'll hear things like uh, chief data officer or uh, manager of uh, customer insights, uh, these sorts of things, um, all related to the, these questions of, of how, do we, uh, how do we tease new insights out of information that will uh, allow us to improve the life of citizens in our cities and, and, and of our, uh, our customers and our, uh, our stakeholders. Uh, it's, it's become a huge, uh, huge area. Uh, there are conferences all over North America uh, one of the biggest is Strata in New York City. Uh, every year now, there's uh, over 3,500 people that attend a conference just on these kinds of questions. There are similar conferences in Silicon Valley and, and around the world, all with uh, huge uh, attendance as well. So this is having an impact on a, a wide variety of industries, uh, all the traditional industries. Um, so, for example, if you're a, a car buff and you're, uh, you're interested in working in the automotive field, um, what we're finding is that more and more people are asking for data science kinds of uh, knowledge, techniques, background as part of uh, the skills that they bring uh, to bear in their day-to-day -day business. Um, so if you're, again, if you're interested in, uh, in the automotive industry, there's uh, lots of opportunities there to, uh, uh, to do things like uh, focus on how do you make automobiles more uh, uh, cost effective, how do you make them uh, more fuel efficient? Um, McKinsey uh, famously uh, a few years ago quoted that there would be a, an overall deficit of something on the order of 20, 30,000 uh, data scientists in North America alone. And, uh, and what we've seen, the way it's played out has been a little bit different than that. In fact, uh, uh, there are uh, definitely needs for highly skilled data scientists specifically, but there's also a much greater demand for people who uh, understand um, how to use uh, database thinking in, uh, in a wide variety of managerial positions. Um, for example, there's a recent survey uh, by PwC where they found that 72% of uh, C-suite executives are saying that uh, for the C-suite executives of the future, they would expect that they would have uh, knowledge and data-based um, decision-making skills as a prerequisite uh, for being in senior management. So the traditional industries, lots of opportunity, uh, but also uh, a huge opportunity in startups as well. There's a, uh, this is why I say it's the most exciting time in a, in a decade. There's a, uh, in uh, the the southern part of the city um, between Queen and King. There's a vibrant startup uh, community there, also Liberty Village and, and many other places 
around the city and, and uh, other cities uh, around North America. We have the Creative Destruction Lab at Brotman. We have, uh, have uh, many accelerators that uh, are bringing forward a whole new crop of, uh, of uh, small entrepreneurial businesses that um, a good deal of these are based on data science and machine learning kinds of techniques. Machine learning is the, the, uh, the technology, the, the, the science behind data science, if you like. Uh, so for example, the Creative Destruction Lab has uh, this year has a cohort of, uh, of uh, new businesses that are going through that are specifically focused on machine learning and, and data scientists, uh, data science. Um, so it's, it's an exciting area. Uh, the future is going to be even more exciting. Uh, we're seeing further developments in artificial intelligence and robotics. Um, so love to have you, uh, have you join in the excitement and, and maybe uh, see you in, uh, in our program at U of T sometime. You know? Thank you very much, Larry. Uh, what a fascinating, er fascinating area and, and um, highly applicable to the category of hot jobs. Um, we're gonna shift focus a little bit into the marketing, PR, and advertising field. I'd like to introduce Stephen Gigliotti, who teaches in our digital multimedia storytelling program. Stephen is an award-winning marketing professional with expertise in branding, product development, and digital multimedia advertising. <clears throat> he has deep experience across multiple business sectors with specialization in pharmaceutical, technology, consumer packaged goods, and automotive brands. He's also a go-to expert for social media, digital out of home, interactive and content marketing. I'm happy to turn the podium over to Stephen and I'm sure you'll, you'll enjoy his presentation. Thank you, Tino. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here speaking with you. And um, what I'd like to do at, uh, in, at first is just kind of address the speed of change and managing the speed of change. In media and, uh, and business communications, we are in a time of, of massive upheaval and disruption. And instead of being intimidated and frustrated by that, I, I'd like to, uh, my students and I, revel in the opportunities this brings. So what I'd like to do is just talk about change um, and that's hitting the marketplace and how that impacts media and communications. And then we'll see what that means in terms of jobs and opportunities in the field. So um, not surprisingly, you all know that the world is being rewired. We, uh, the internet uh, uh, blew up in the late 90s in terms of the consumer uh, platform. And now in, with social media and different, different areas of media fragmentation, we are seeing nothing short than the, the rewiring of our civilization. And in media and communications with marketing so in, inextricably tied to those communications, um, not changing is effectively a death knell. So what you're seeing now in terms of jobs is the acceleration of change and the adoption of new technologies at a speed at which is literally disrupting decades long of communication. One of those would be our, our lovely newspapers. Um, there is a website called uh, Newspaper Death Watch, which I point to as more of a joke than anything else. But the fact that a website <coughs> gleefully records the ending of print journalism as we know it is something we should all take with a um, with uh, not a grain of salt, but uh, as a as a path to learning and moving forward. Um, technology is literally changing to the point where we have an entire new generation that has never really been watching cable television. They're called the uh, the cord nevers. So. There are cord cutters in the world now that are ditching their Rogers and Telco uh, communication uh, subscriptions, but there's a whole generation that has never used, uh, never seen cable TV. And what does this mean? This means the Mad Men age, age of uh, ad agencies is just that, a quaint relic, really. So my course and uh, my, my, uh, my focus here at the school is to embrace change at, at the speed at which it's happening. I mean, I, I don't have the luxury of teaching something that has long ingrained um, processes and, and, and backgrounds. Um, the, for example, the medium of peer of Mercat and Periscope existed on a whiteboard 18 months ago, and now they're popular social media platforms that celebrities and major brands are using on a daily basis. So 
Or one other thing that is coming that you may or may not have heard of is called IoT or the Internet of Things. So let, let's take a look at that as how it, how it relates to media and advertising, marketing, and jobs. So the Internet of Things is um, basically, you can explain it quickly as sensors and devices being deployed in the world um, and all speaking to each other. These protocols are now being developed um, and they already exist. So the Nest thermostat, for example, or, or smart devices, uh, cars that drive themselves, which, which have been alluded to in this webinar already. This is all collectively known as the Internet of Things. And what does that mean to media and communications? Well, it means that your house will get to know you. When you get home, it will start the oven. It will preheat something for you. And the brands and, and marketers that need to communicate with you will soon be able to tie into the Internet of Things and tell stories and communicate um, brand advantages um, to you directly. It's, it's a revolution that is, is, is going to be very significant. Um, the internet has rewired our culture, but the internet of things is going to rewire our literally the physical world around us. And one of the most exciting things that I'm talking about in my course is tying the virtual world to the real world. And what do I mean by that? So for example, if you go to a beauty salon and you're going to be there for two or three hours, why doesn't the salon know that you're there? You, you go on a regular basis. We know who you are. We know what your interests are. So that content can be served up on your mobile phone in a curated and intelligent way. That is the future of branding and communication. The future of multimedia storytelling is tied to smart devices, smart infrastructures, and the intelligent universe of the internet, which is so full of information that it's moving into the physical world intelligently. For many, many years, we sat at desktops and viewed the World Wide Web through a browser at a desktop, searching and pulling content towards us. We are on the verge of a revolution where that information will find us in our real world lives. It will know where we are. It will know our preferences. It will know our predilections, our curiosities, our, our desires, and the information will be served up to us. That's an exciting opportunity, I think. A lot of people are maybe intimidated by this or scared by it. But it is, it is not something that will not happen. It is happening already. And the avalanche of change is only going to speed up. So for job seekers, while looking for titles might be a good idea, those titles don't necessarily exist. The protocols and the languages for these devices to speak to each other are simply being invented now as we speak. So what I would urge you to do is to not be afraid of change, to embrace change and keep learning. That's what's so exciting about teaching at the U of T School of, Community, of Continuing Studies, that the pace of change gives us literally infinite opportunities to engage and learn as these technologies overwhelm our lives and, and enhance our lives. So um, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, and I hope we have some great questions. Thank you very much, Stephen. What a great presentation. And I love the theme of feeling empowered in the face of the disruptive change that's happening in society today. Um, through learning and continuing studies. So now we're going to go to the question period and uh, we're going to um, pull up the questions that uh, people have been sending in during the um, webinar. And I can see that the first set of questions are on the topic of project management. So Peter, can you talk about um, how can one attain the PMP designation with experience on projects in the workplace? I'm a worker with experience on projects, but not sure how to count these hours towards the designation. I'd be glad to talk to you about that. So the first thing to do is to go on the PMI website, PMI.org. Even if you're not a member, they PMI has a spot on there where you can start recording your work experience. And they have very detailed instructions to explain how to record your work ex work experience and how to count the hours that you need to have. Basically, you need to have 4,500 hours if you have a university degree, 7,500 hours if you don't. And th they've got the explanation. So start off with that to get your um, work hours recorded. And then as you start getting closer to the 4,500 hours, 
then you can start thinking about what you need to do to be prepared to write the PMP exam. I would add the other thing that um, PMI requires before you write the PMP exam is 35 hours of project management training, which of course clearly one of the project management courses here at the School of Continuing Studies will be able to, to satisfy. Great. Um, so the next question is actually on data science, but actually I think Stephen uh, uh, might have some comments here as well. The question is, as a marketer, what degree of data science skill do I need? How technical would I need to be? For example, would I need to learn SQL or R language? Would I need to be able to build an uh, econometric model? Well, it, it depends where you want to go with it. Um, there's so many of these models now that are canned and are very easy to use. You don't really need a, a, a lot of technical knowledge or programming skill to be able to, to use them. The, the only thing is that it's very important that you understand the conditions under which any particular model is appropriate because it's very easy to take a model and say, okay, so this looks like a, a, a an appropriate description of a, a, you know a, a particular uh, audience demographic, let's say, and use it. But unless you know the the assumptions that were built into the model in the first place, you could end up with results that, that are not at all uh, what you expect. If you want to go beyond that and do uh, really groundbreaking things and uh, you know try your own uh, new approaches, new algorithms. Um, yeah, those, those kinds of additional uh, um, skills are, are useful. Um, I, I would concur. I, I think it's a, a slippery slope to just get caught up in one language or, or one technology, especially when you're looking at the, in the marketing space. Um, it's more, I would, I would urge the focus to be on the business case and the KPIs or the key performance indicators of any, any any initiative or campaign, and then uh, adjust the technologies to, to that. Okay, great. Uh, question for Deb. Uh, Deb, you talked a lot about the soft skills that are really becoming more important in risk management. What about the analytical skills and, and specific technical skills that uh, a risk manager would need? Well, your CRM designation um, is split into three separate areas. You have your foundations, which is it's not mandatory to take it first, but it does provide you with a lot of the theories and the concepts that you build on as you continue to go through. Um, risk control is more analytical, and then the final piece is risk financing. So uh, there are a lot of soft skills that are involved, but those going through those three uh, specific courses should give you um, enough of an understanding that you can, you can build through experience. Okay, great, thank you. Um, question on digital storytelling. Um, Stephen, can you go into a little bit more detail about exactly what happens in digital storytelling? <clears throat> Is it more of a web content creation and management activity or role? Uh, fair enough. Uh, we're viewing it in, in the course and in the certificate in general, we're viewing it as a, from a very wide perspective. Um, the word multimedia, if you're old enough to recall, um, those days in the 90s might have been CD-ROMs and like clunky uh, interfaces. But I, I'm taking the uh, modern view of what multimedia means. And in our course, we're looking at every possible media. It's just that simple. So we don't rule anything out. And it's actually not just digital per se. I had a, I had, um, a, a question from one of my learners about, um, about technology where it was only online. And I said, no, 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 there's plenty of non-online marketing and activities going on. So, so I'm viewing media and we're viewing media as all platforms of media. And what's exciting about that is as new platforms are generated in the social space, they are automatically included in our focus. Okay, great. Um, another question about risk management. And it's actually a great one it's related to continuing studies. Um, Deb, how practical are the risk management courses? And are the skills actually transferable to the workplace? Uh, that's an excellent question. And I'm going to say it's absolutely um, essential that you take those into the workplace. It's the courses that you, um, that you go through with your CRM. Uh, they're transferable to any type of workplace. And I think I mentioned that, that what's, what's interesting with risk management is you can implement into any type of industry. So if you're in, like I am, the government sector, um, the, all of those skills are absolutely, absolutely transferable no matter where you are. Okay. Question for Peter, project management. 
introvert versus extrovert PMOs. Is there <laughs> any leadership courses to differentiate these personality types and who's more successful <laughs> in the role? Uh, interesting question. Now, actually, it's, it's a topic that I'm having some debate about whether introvert or extroverts make better project managers. Um, and the reality is, is that it doesn't matter. It, it, it really is whatever your personality type is, you can be a successful project manager. But what we are finding is that depending on the organization culture and the type of project you are, there is a better fit based on your personality type. So if you have a project that does require someone to be a lot more outgoing, to be much more comfortable talking to the various stakeholders, an extrovert, you put an introvert into that project, it won't, it won't be a successful match. However, there could be a project which requires a lot of reflection and a lot of in-depth research and study where an introvert could do extremely well in as a project manager. So there's not one answer. It's, it depends on the fit between the project, um, the project, the organization culture, and the project manager to what works, works best as well. PMOs. Um, so project management office, I personally prefer the that acronym stand for Peter Monkhouse's office. <laughs> um, but PMOs is a concept that's being more and more used by organizations to help improve the maturity of the practice of project management within their organization. It has a number of varieties of what they can do. I'll keep my comments rather brief. We do have a course in our advanced project management certificate talking specifically about PMOs, but generally speaking, they will implement a methodology that's appropriate for the organization. They'll coach and train and mentor project managers. They will select projects, make sure the right project is being done at the right time. They'll do reporting on projects to help with the organization culture and support, or they'll do audits to help make sure that the projects are being done with appropriate methodology. And the final one is that they'll do resource assignments, managing key resources. PMOs can do all or some of these, What's important for a PMO is that it does what's most, what's most valued by the organization to help the organization achieve its strategy and it's used as a tool to do that. Okay. So that, leave it at that, I could go on and talk for the rest of the time, but I'm sure there's lots of other questions. So, you know. <laughs> uh, question about uh, data science and big data. Um, typically where in large organizations does the responsibility for this kind of analysis and use of data reside? And is that an important factor in, in deciding how to pursue a career and what sort of experience you need to get? Well, it's been changing a lot. Um, traditionally, uh, interest in data was, was sort of spread through the organization. What we've seen in the last few years, and I mentioned some of these, uh, these new titles like chief data officer, um, some of these people are, are very senior people in the organization reporting uh, uh, either to the president or in some cases to the, uh, the CIO, but, but more commonly, uh, the focus on data has been outside of the IT organization and in one of the other main lines. And, and in fact, in some organizations as well, we've seen uh, multiple data officers, um, for example, in retail data officers that are focused specifically on uh, retail and merchandising, whereas others that are more focused on uh, inbound logistics and, and those sorts of things. Um, so it's... Uh, much more senior than it used to be, but uh, it's um, uh, th there are there are roles all the way through the, the organizational structure. Great. Um, let's go to multimedia storytelling. Sure. Um, Stephen, you spoke about um, the possibility to sort of bridge both traditional uh, advertising PR and digital uh, mm -hmm. campaigns. Can you talk about some of the more sort of complex types of campaigns that sort of bridge that digital physical? Um, space sure um you're seeing in the out of home space um and, and i'm doing this uh, in my in my 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 real world day-to-day -day job is um you're seeing a convergence of uh of, since the fragmentation of media has have, has left audiences unable to be reached in many ways the way they used to be the the uh the focus is now taking out of home media and and zeroing in uh, using data, using advanced tools to, to connect those two spaces. So it, this is relatively new, um, but it's, it's, it's an interesting dynamic because while traditional media is fragmenting, we still are out and about living our daily lives. 
So we are able to be reached on the Gardner Expressway coming into Toronto. We are able to be communicated to as we walk down the street uh, in certain areas. Um, so, so tying that online communication to your physical presence is what's happening more and more, and I only see that accelerating. It's, it's, um, and it's also like I was saying in my in my presentation. There's such a vast amount of online information now, both personal to us and also shared by us, that <clears throat> that the synergy of pulling that all together is is making for the next generation in marketing and communication. It's not so much a generic push; it's becoming a smart pull. Fair enough. Yes, that's good. Um, Deborah, um, a, a question directed to you, but I, I think it's an interesting question that maybe the whole panel can comment on. For very new industries like driverless cars and drones that you mentioned, how would one enter these fields if employers are unsure of what's required for these types of positions? And I think, I think by extending that question, how are you seeing organizations respond to this rapid pace of disruptive change when everything is so new and, and the unknown is, is arriving every day? Well, that's a really interesting question, and that's the whole basis behind enterprise risk management. Um, when we talked about things like the drones and the driverless cars, um, there's a number of, of governing bodies, so to speak, that are, are struggling to, to come up with that. So a drone, for example, is considered an aircraft, which falls under the Transportation Authority, right? Um, and they're trying desperately to come up with rules and regulations. We use them personally in Brampton for our fire department, right? So if, if we're responding to a very significant fire, they want the drone have to have the ability to go over before the crews go in. So we had to sit down um, with the powers that be to figure out how we were going to best manage that. We needed to comply with the federal aviation um, and we needed to, uh, to openly be able to tell them who was properly trained and what we were gonna do with the data. So there's all different elements that come into play, and that's when you have to sit down with the people that are being affected within the organization to do a true risk analysis of what that looks like. Driverless cars, um, I, I have a, a good friend of mine that's way up in, in an insurance company, and we thought they were looking at it from a negative perspective, but they're not. They're looking at that as a really positive opportunity. They want to be the first big insurance company to be able to offer a product to driverless cars, right? Because typically, from an insurance perspective, you insure the driver, you don't insure the vehicle, right? So that you have to have the flexibility to shift the way you look at things, okay? Maybe, uh, Tino, if yes. I could just add yes. a little bit, and, and um, maybe jumping on Larry here a bit, but from mm -hmm. his experience, and I have the experience as, as an entrepreneur starting off a company, I think what I'm seeing is that organizations aren't being very good at adapting to these new technologies and re getting jobs in their organizations for it. But what it does mean, I think, for people is it creates a wonderful opportunity to be an entrepreneur and start your own company, which there's a number of things in the city that you've mentioned, including Mars that's affiliated with the University of Toronto, to help entrepreneurs get started to show how these technologies can use and change the way that we're going. After all, if we think about technologies and then we look at the stories of the founders of many of the large technology companies now, Bill Gates, Mark Druckenberg, they didn't start working for large organizations. They started as an entrepreneur with a small company and have grown to be a huge organization. The next question is actually, I'm gonna direct it to the panel because I think all, all of you um, have, um, would have great insight into this. Um, the School of Continuing Studies programs and courses, virtually all of them are open enrollment with no prerequisites. So the question is, when you think about the program that you teach in, what background experience or even prior education would you advise someone have if, if they need uh, before they come into the foundation level course in your program? Why don't we start with Stephen? Um, I, I, it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm teaching a new course, and the level of uh, the level of um, involvement, enthusiasm, and actual skill is is surprisingly uh, professional, which is thrilling for me. 
But, but I do think in terms of my course and my focus uh, on digital multimedia story and brand journalism is a basic understanding of marketing and advertising is key. Um, and then an appreciation, again, of what I spoke before of the technology and the changes and, and, and affecting social media and, and, and media in general. So that's really all I would say in terms of a prerequisite. And then, of course, just the enthusiasm about dealing with change. Um, that's all it would be, really. Um, but again, um, it's, uh, it's because of the acceleration in media change and fragmentation and because of social media's influence in our day-to-day -day lives, it's actually a pretty, uh, a pretty easy on -ramp. For the, for the uh, enterprise analytics program, it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting. We get a very wide variety of different people that uh, come to take the program. Some people that uh, have uh, no statistics or no programming background at all. Some people, on the other hand, who are uh, at the Fields Institute here at U of T with multiple math degrees that are very interested in taking their uh, you know their background in uh, in math and uh, and finding employment uh, um, in, in you know, uh, practical business terms. So um, for us, what we've been doing is we've been thinking about how to uh, how to arrange the the entry in a way that allows people that if they have uh, specific skills like statistics, for example, they can um, write a little. Uh, uh, separate exam that will allow them to uh, to go directly past that particular course or alternatively uh, we have courses in, in all the prerequisites but what we do look for is for people who uh, have uh, either a math or science or engineering background but we have people as well that come from uh, from marketing from um, uh, survey companies so there's a pretty wide variety um, so in in the CRM program uh, again, we're just like you. We have a very wide range of expertise that comes through the door. We get people from all different uh, industries that want to get their designation. Um, there is no specific level of education that's a requirement for you to come into the class. Um, it helps if you, um, if you can come in and, and keep a very open mind and have the flexibility to really engage and change as you see your industry evolve. Um, we've got a lot of people that come in that want to make a career change, that perhaps may have been in the insurance business that want, you know, that see the benefit of risk management and they want to transfer in. Um, so we do get quite a wide range of expertise coming through the door. For project management, um, again, we have a very wide range of people who come into the, into the program. Um, now I'm on the PMI Education Foundation board. We do have one of our bylines as being project management for the social good and it's a life skill. So in fact, the reality is that everyone has managed the project, whether it be how to get an assignment done in school, whether it's to find a place to, to live, whether it's to buy a car or make a, some other major purchase. Even my daughter, when she was sick and six and got frustrated with her parents not planning her birthday party started becoming a project manager. <laughs> so we, everyone has some project manager experience, which is what helps in the course. And then we help to help build on that and grow that to become more uh, experienced in managing projects. That's great, very informative. Well, that was our last question. That's all we have time for today. So I wanna thank everyone for sending in such great questions. Uh, I think it shows that uh, we, um, uh, provided a session that was informative and useful, so thank you for that. Um, if we didn't get to your question, we are going to follow up with uh, uh, an email, a response with some uh, information for you from our from our panel. So I'd like to thank our uh, panel right now. Uh, Peter Munkos teaches program and portfolio management in our project management program. Deb Traconia, who teaches both foundations of risk management and risk control in our certificate in risk management program. Larry Simon, who teaches foundations of enterprise data analytics concepts and controls in our certificate in management of enterprise data analytics program. And Stephen Gigliotti, who teaches in our digital multimedia storytelling program. Thank you very much. We are going to wrap up for, um, if you're charting your professional development plan and uh, looking for opportunities, 
I think, I hope you found today's session inspiring, motivating, and uh, full of great information. As I said at the beginning, uh, we thought this was a great opportunity for you to see not only the depth and breadth of expertise that our instructors bring to the classroom and share with our learners, but also their passion and interest in lifelong learning and continuing education and the success of our, uh, success of our learners. So I wanna thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us on the webinar. So again, thank you to our guests and look forward to seeing you at the school.